here this morning. God bless you all. It's good to be in the house of God with my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I just want to welcome all of you here this morning. Just, uh, just a few um, words. I want to read something out of um, the last while I've been doing some reading in the book of um, Numbers. And um, just some things that I, that I um, have come across here in Numbers and just looking at the, the children of Israel as they were journeying in the wilderness in chapter 14 of Numbers. It says, and so all the congregation, they lifted up their voices. They wept and cried that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us elect a leader and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. I had to think of, and, and the Lord later in the chapter, he, he said this to Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people reject me? How long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? You know, it's really interesting that the children of Israel could have were, experienced so many miracles and so many signs and so many wonders. And here they were, were delivered from such a mighty and powerful hand out of Egypt. And yet, there's something in them that always longed to go back. They wanted to go back. And all of a sudden, I realized that... Um, you know, sometimes even in our lives, we can be delivered from so many things in life. Be baptized in the Red Sea. Watch Pharaoh's armies completely decimated and destroyed. Have manna come from heaven and feed us. Water coming out of rocks and watering us. Having quail, even meat, being delivered to us. And yet still, we want to go back to Egypt. Isn't that amazing? I began to conclude that signs and wonders aren't the most important thing in life because it clearly didn't help the children of Israel believe anymore. They still wanted to go back to Egypt where they came from. And there's a verse in Proverbs 23, verse 7, where it says, So as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You see, there's a way that we think, and then there's a way that our heart thinks. The way that our heart thinks is our subconscious. The way you think sometimes, you don't even realize how you think. And so, <clears throat> you know, there's, a, there's kind of a, a therapy out there that says if you stand in the mirror every morning and you just repeat a certain line over and over and over, that somehow you'll be successful. The problem is that's not necessarily the way your heart thinks. That's just the way your mind thinks. Because most people will do that and they'll go right back out to doing whatever they've always done before and they'll keep living just the way they think out of their heart and nothing really ever changes. And so it's said that an entire generation could never see the promised land simply because of the way they thought in their heart. And the way that your subconscious and what you believe and what you choose to think about in your subconscious has a destination and you will arrive there. And so um, there's a phrase that my wife has on our, um, I wrote it down here somewhere, has a phrase that we put, she has on a, um, the side of the kitchen on one of the cupboards. And it was during a time when we really went through some difficult things and it says, don't miss the amazing by the unexpected. Sometimes things come up very unexpectedly and it looks like it's, it's a defeat. It looks like it's a setback. But really, um, there's something amazing that God wants to do through that. And what the children of Israel didn't realize is this wilderness was just temporary. It was a means of going from one place to another. Years ago, I was driving along. I was heading out to Youngstown for a job. And I, I, was, there, I was driving, and there was this thunderstorm that... 
um, I was driving through the whole time. So I just checked my, back then, radar was kind of new on a phone, so it was kind of interesting to see. And so I got my phone out and I realized there was just one tiny little thunderstorm, and I was literally driving with it. Uh, all of a sudden it occurred to me, if I just pull over and let this storm pass, I wouldn't be driving with it. When I got to my job site, the Lord so clearly said, you know, sometimes you're in a thunderstorm, and if you just quit trying so hard to work it all out, just pull off and let the storm pass. Storms and wildernesses are seasons in life. You know, we're in the middle of January, and some of you may not like winter, but guess what? Spring is coming. Just hold on. It's going to be here before you know it. And so don't get discouraged. And don't, get, don't, don't be discouraged by the wilderness or the season in life that you're in. Because we were never meant to stay there. It's just simply to pass through. Don't set up a tent and camp somewhere that you were simply meant to journey through. And, uh, and so, anyways, the children of Israel spent their whole lives in a desert because they could not see. And sometimes when our, when our, when our mind is in such a, a negative, has such a negative spin on things, even blessings don't look like blessings. They look like problems. And so, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. All right, I'm going to... Uh, have the children, you can be dismissed at this time for your Sunday school classes. Just a few announcements, Pastor John and Karen. They are in South Carolina right now. I don't know the name of the church, but they're at Matt Yoder's church. I, th I think he's doing some ministry there. So that is where they are at. And uh, I look forward to hearing again from Pastor Wayne. And uh, he's been battling a little bit of flu this week. So uh, let's pray that the Lord gives his voice and his body strength as he brings us the word this morning. Also, just one other announcement. Um, if, if we could keep in mind at the end of the service, we love when our children come up and they celebrate and they worship with us. Maybe um, just in case, there, perhaps the way um, a service ends, if it's more of a, a, an ending where it's more of a time where people might want to come forward and pray and respond to the altar, maybe it would be good to just keep our children back if you sense that that's kind of what's going on, but otherwise, by all means, allow them to come up and worship and celebrate. Um, just, yeah, maybe parents just be sensitive in that. If you sense that it's a time where it's more of a, a, an altar call type of ending, maybe just hold them back um, during that time. But for the most part, if the ending is more of a, in, a, in a celebration form, by all means, have them come up and celebrate and uh, worship the Lord with us. That's, that's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. I love to see that here. So, all right, that's all I have. May the Lord bless you. I'll turn the time to the uh, worship team.
Till the storms are over 
kind of surprised that there's that many people here today knowing that there's a snowstorm right west of us. So you probably came prepared, drive home over the hills and that we have here in this community and on uh, slippery slopes and everything. So um, bless the Lord. I don't know what I have here. I, I think I'm okay. I was sick during the week here and uh, had the flu. Somebody asked me if the subject that I'm addressing is ties that bind, and this is part number two, wondering if that's perhaps um, the enemy. We know sickness is from the enemy. We know that. Uh, it was the fall of man where sickness was introduced, but I don't believe that's the reason we're living in the flu season. And uh, so easily something can be picked up and so forth. <clears throat> Today we will be addressing some, I believe, a very important subject that has been very misunderstood down through the years of my time. Um, uh, again, we spoke uh, last Sunday on forgiveness, the difference between forgiveness and deliverance. And today I would like to speak on deliverance, but perhaps in a different way. Now, sooner or later in these series of messages, I will be speaking about the things in the line of witchcraft, um, there's a lot of things that I'll be addressing because I do have a lot of experience. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm well-rounded in experience with dealing with a lot of these conflicts that the enemy has introduced. Some of the things uh, that I'll be speaking and addressing is yoga. Uh, where does it come from? Uh, how do we deal with it? Uh, from any type of potions and witchcrafts and sorcery and divination of all different types. I will be speaking about essential oils. I have been introduced to essential oils before America was as a whole. When I was in Egypt, a Muslim guide told me that soon, real soon, you will now uh, see a flow of essential oils coming into America. And we will take you to the place where this originates. And it was in a temple of a god called the raw God. And so I have a lot of information on some of the symbols and symbolic things we found in that temple that we find today in America on even our modern medicines. Uh, just uh, for instance, the Chrysler's logo is found over uh, three, 4,000 years ago. We saw it right there. I have a picture of it where the Chrysler logo comes from. And many things that we'll be uncovering and how do we deal with living in a day when all these things are prevalent amongst us? How do we discern? And some of you will probably be struck by some things and mystified by some things. And what do I make out of this? I didn't know this was from a bad source. And uh, so forth. We'll be speaking on those subjects, but not today. Today I want to further speak on deliverance. Remember that I spoke about <clears throat> the difference between deliverance and forgiveness and how deliverance works. And so today we will look at that as far as the cleansing of the flesh and spirit. Today we'll be looking more in the line of the spiritual cleansing. And if you could kind of pray for me, I'm already seeing that I'm going to have a little struggle Perhaps we will see, maybe the Lord will assist me here as we go with the word. But when the word of the Lord comes out of your mouth, you don't know for sure what will happen. So I will probably be drinking some water here and there. So I'm sorry about that. I try, always try not to. Um, but today we will see. Father, I just pray now that this message that is to be delivered that you have asked me to deliver. I want to address it again and address you as being the head. I'm not the head of this church, nor is anyone in this church the head of the church. We know that you are the head of the church. And I come to you this morning again and asking you, how can I assist you? How can I assist you? You have the greater burden because you're the head. And I pray, Father, that you would help me, 
through this time that I struggle some with my, uh, my lungs because of uh, some conflict I had, sickness that I've recovered from, but now the results are still with some phlegm and issues like this that has to be cough, coughed out typically. So we just pray for super uh, divine intervention that you would help me and strengthen my voice as we go through this. Father, I pray even a greater prayer, and that is that you would help me with great plainness of speech to go through these things and to teach them correctly. Also that people can really understand it clearly. Because we are talking, we'll be talking about a lot of things today that we have heard about with our eyes. Maybe we've, we've even lived in these areas. And Lord, we just pray that your name would be glorified, that your Holy Spirit's presence would be so here to convey, be the great conveyor from the lips to the heart. Father, we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. One of the things that we'll be dealing with is how to deal with sickness. Because sickness is a problem. It is a problem because it started as a result of sin. And we need to have a proper understanding of it. Back in the 1970s, I was introduced in the 80s and 70s with some modern thinking at that point in positive confession by saying uh, the, the positive confession and the negative confession. And I followed that for a little bit and I saw the end of where that, some of that has led to. I remember the time when this big crystal cathedral was being built out of glass out in Southern California. And it was built on some very positive thoughts and positive confessions. And then I also lived the day when the whole thing bankrupt, and today it belongs to a Catholic church. So I look at some of the risings and falls of some of the experiences that I've had concerning doctrine, concerning how to handle the Word of God, how to receive the Word of God, how does the Word of God affect you, what can I do on my part so that the Word of God has a greater impact in my life. Now, the last time I spoke, one of the last times I spoke on this subject, I was opposed by someone so strong after um, very strong opposition I got from it that I started shaking at that moment. And to be honest with you, that has not left me yet. My wife sees it. I have uh, this struggle with, I think what had happened is it pushed my nerves right over the top a little bit. And as time goes on, I believe the Lord will set me free from it. Uh, I don't believe it is, a, uh, it is a spirit to buffet me like Paul had, because it's not a hindrance to me. But we go through things and we go through very difficult times. And I have much to teach our younger generation in places not to go and things not to do and not to overload your mental system by being under so much stress that later on you'll suffer a lot. Uh, I've learned well to manage finances, but I did not learn well how to manage my heart, I was told by a, um, by a physician. And so I'm trying to convey that to other people. The Bible does say, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. How do we do that? How is that done? How do we cast a care? I've seen nets being cast into the Sea of Galilee, and they're cast in different. They're not just let down. They go like this, and they go like this so that they have a complete spread, and as they fly out, it covers a huge area. And the net itself, when you put it in a ball, is maybe this big. But when you cast it, it becomes big so that it catches everything. And when Jesus says, cast all your cares upon me, for I care for you. What did he mean by that? It means there's a right way to cast your nets so that it covers more, more square inches at bay. So <clears throat> what we want to look at I'll probably be speaking about some things that some of you have never heard, but if you've followed me through my life, some of your newer people probably have never heard of me. 
saying some of these things and believe the way I believe, according to the word. Uh, but I hope that your eyes be open and that you'll be able to walk in a truth that I've walked in for many years. And I contribute all my successes, all my successes that I have, in which some of you that know me well would indicate or would, would conclude that I've been a very successful man coming from a very poor educational background. And that all happened when the Holy Spirit came on me because the wisdom that came upon me came from above. And it was not thought out or read in books, but it came from the Holy Spirit. And as it worked for me, it can work for you. I want you not to be defensive of anything I speak about today, but open your heart and allow the Holy Spirit to minister things to you because there's a lot of variety and a lot of color to the things that I'll be speaking about. And I think it's a, it's a message that is so needed. And if I can somehow deliver it to you clearly, so help me God. The Lord taught us how to pray. And when this caught me, I might have to <clears throat> speak a little quieter just to, Lord, I'm trusting you for my voice. There was a time when I knew you would call me into the ministry. And I was yet a young man down in what is known as the prayer shack. And that night that you spoke to me and you said, you will be the one that I choose, I said no, because I know what I believe is the Word of God. And in the conflict of where I come from and the culture I come from, it will be too hard. It will be harder than what I can trust you to carry me through. And I remember that night you closed my mouth. I could not speak for several hours. It was shut. It was as though you touched me on my head. And the part in my brain that makes me talk would not function. I could open my mouth. I could move it. But it was missing like that. And the people that were around me that night, they saw this and with great concern started praying for me. And I finally took a piece of paper and I wrote down the things and what was happening. And the Lord spoke to me. He could speak to me, but I could not open my mouth. And I flipped up, opened this very book right here, this Bible. I flipped it open and there was a verse that was underlined when Zachariah could not open his mouth because he would not believe that Elizabeth will have a baby. And I knew it was my unbelief that shut my mouth. And with great concern and yet a big surrender in front of me, I knelt there, I lay there, and I sat there. And all at once I felt something wooing in me, and I want you to hear this wooing in me. It was as a sprouted seed, a little seed, and it started bursting open. And it, I felt it come up out of my heart and out through my lips. And when it came out of my lips, the word was, I believe. And it felt as though my lips shot out this far. And this is where I said, Lord, I will preach your gospel I choose to believe I will preach your gospel, but I do request one thing from you, and that is, will you always help me that my voice never gives out what I preach? And I want to remind you of that covenant, Father, and you will help me today. Blessed be the Lord. That's a true incident that happened. Hallelujah. So I noticed here <clears throat> some time Several years ago, some of you heard this, that I noticed that in my life, I was, if there was a sense of a lot of evil that stood against me. And I didn't know what's, it almost seemed to be an open door. And a lot of evil things could kind of come and approach me. And it was the idea of bringing destruction to me. And I had such a concern about that I spent nights up in my room and I would pray and I would ask the Lord. One morning he 
brought me to this verse that I'm now to begin this message with. And forgive us our debts, as we also forgive everyone their debts against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And I said, Lord, how do I get delivered from the evil one? I've repented of everything I know. I've confessed of every sin I've done. But how do I, how am I delivered from the evil one? If you look at the original here, it doesn't say deliver us from evil, but the actual is from the evil one. The evil one is the devil. So if we sense that there is a demonic power, and we're talking about deliverance today, deliverance, the difference between deliverance and forgiveness. You see, some people live under this constant gloom and doom of a cloud over here, and others live in this brightness. If this is your life, and you always sense a gloomy doomy, if it can go wrong with you, it will go wrong. If there is something anywhere that it would happen to concerning evil, it always falls on me. Some people have that. Some people say those things. And this is their experience. You need to be delivered from evil. How do you get delivered from evil? What the Lord showed me now, <clears throat> I would like to speak. I have a, there's a, I think there's a young man over here that shared something with me last Sunday. Um, had quite a response from a lot of people last. I don't see him today. But he said that he has a problem at night sometimes that he almost seems to be sleeping. And then in his sleep he's dreaming and in his dream he's sleeping as another person. And then all at once he can't breathe. It's not necessarily something to choke you, but it's something that happens even beyond that. You are like, I'm laying here sleeping, and I'm dreaming that I'm living during the day something, and now I go to bed and I fall asleep. And in that second sleep I'm in, it's the best way to describe it, there's something that gets me that will not allow me to breathe. And I have a problem with this. And this happened numerous times through the difficult times here in the past seven years that I've gone through. Numerous times where I finally sense this is actually the devil that is trying to bring death to me. But I didn't know how to deal with it. I renounced it. I asked in Jesus' name that it be removed from me. Anything that I would have touched in my life that would have brought this destruction to me, I renounced, I cast it away from me, but it continued. There was times when I was laying in bed and I could, I know my wife was there, I knew that, but I couldn't move. I was like froze completely solid. And it was like, I'm dying. This is, I'm not coming out of this. And even if I'm coming out of this, then it seemed to be another label, uh, uh, layer. It was almost like several levels. Now, <clears throat> I'm aware that some other people have experienced this. And my thing was, well, what has happened, Father? What I need is to be delivered from evil. See, our thoughts often, when we talk about delivered from evil, we're thinking delivered from sins. I'm not speaking about being delivered from sins. I'm, that was last Sunday. I'm speaking about delivered from evil. And I noticed here, one morning, as I then got up, went to my room, I went on my knees again, Father. And I, a lot of times I come to him with a great and precious, not a habitual prayer, that he taught us how to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Hmm. And I remember at that point it kind of stopped. Forgive me my debts as I forgive my debtors. Lead me not into temptation, Deliver me from evil. Huh. And I noticed immediately, and I stopped that prayer, and God started dealing with me. Forgiveness, temptation, evil. Last Sunday we spoke temptation, sins. Today, deliver us from evil. And it seems there be, there's a threefold connection here. Forgiveness, or, or uh, 
forgiveness from sins, temptation, and then from the evil one. Deliver us from evil. And we could go on, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. And for the next hours, the Lord had me go through my entire life. And I read my entire life. And I would ask you to consider this at some point in your own life. I went back in my own life, all the way from my childhood, from the people, from being abused as a young, a young lad, up in the square of Mount Hope, Ohio, in an old building on the third floor by a cousin. When I was a very young boy, very innocent, I remember it vividly where it happened. That building is not there now, but is the same building, the same corner, where the Kilbuck Savings Bank is to this moment. The next one was, Dalen, if you're here, right in the back of Mount Hope Fence, up on the hill, right on this side of that, that forest, that woods that is up there. I was helping in the fields, working in the field, where an adult man abused me, and it was not good. I could pretty much walk you to that place right where it happened. It left that kind of an impact. And then I go back and I come into this life where I'm now, and I look at, if those things would not have happened, would I be a different person today? And those were the questions that were haunting me for some years. Some of you are sitting here today, or going to be listening to me perhaps, that have those same questions. If my childhood would have been different, if I would have been delivered from the evil one as a young man, would I have gone through the difficulties that I have today? Would I be more successful if I would not have gone through or been told something when I was younger? Maybe, maybe not, but all I know is to be delivered from the evil one, God, through the Holy Spirit, had me go back and repeat my entire story from a young childhood to some of the whippings I remember getting that were maybe perhaps more brutal and maybe from a angry person at the moment and ask individually to forgive by name all those people. And I thought, hmm, it took a while as the Lord refreshed my memory Remember, I forgive this teacher. I forgive this person because he accused me of doing something that I didn't do. He was actually the one that did it, and I paid the cost for it when I was a schoolboy. And the story just continues to go on. And I went back down, I went to bed, and I slept. The next night, God woke me again, took me back up in that room, and had me repeat the entire story again. How many times do we forgive someone? Many times. So I forgave them all again. And I forgive them all again. And I forgive them all again. And this is how it works to be delivered from the evil one. You forgive the people that have made life miserable for you. To be delivered from the evil one, we forgive. This is where God sent me, into the closet of forgiveness. And this is where he keeps me from harm's way of the evil one, in the closet of forgiveness. And there, I will not pull out any trash, but I walk out of there as a free man. And as long as it takes you to forgive someone by name, you need to know that closet because this is what God showed me to be delivered from the evil one. It has been to be done by forgiveness. Interesting enough, Jesus on the cross, one of the last words he said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. It's not your parents' fault. It's not that man's fault. And it's not that woman's fault. They can only hurt you when you can't forgive them. But when you can forgive them, you are free from them. Always remember that. That's a tremendous big truth. 
As long as they hurt you, as long as you don't forgive them, they hurt you. The only way that you can take their hands that have gripped themselves around you is forgive them. And that releases you from their grip. But if you choose to hold forgive unforgiveness, you will be choosing to be under the tormentor's hands. And that tormentor is the evil one. The Bible says that. We need to forgive lest we be delivered into the tormentor's hands. This is one of the items that can be a tie that binds you. And it is to be free from these things where we start looking into the promises of God and where we can go on and further in the kingdom. One of the things that I would like to make clear to you in the beginning here also is that I understand this also is not necessarily an everyday message from perhaps places where you have been. But if you want to go deeper in the Christian life and the Christian experience, there is ways to go deeper with God. These are some of these ways that will take you much deeper, where the power of God becomes much more visible to you, where there's a much greater deliverance in your life, where there's much greater power through the Holy Spirit in your life. It is the place where miracles happen. It is the place where kingdoms get thrown down. It is the place where the power of God is very present. Many Christians don't want to go that deep with God. They just want to be able to escape hell, but not to be very useful. And what I'm teaching you is something in how to become more useful in the kingdom of God, that you don't only go through life and just barely experience salvation, but in that salvation, there's a tremendous amount of truth that is yet to be unveiled as you walk through in obedience before God. These are some of these things. Matthew chapter 4, verse 16. I spoke a little bit about this, but I'm not going to speak much about it, but only repeat so that you can hear what I said at the end of last Sunday. The people that sat in darkness saw great light, and to them that sat in the region and sat in the shadow of death, light is sprung up. We're talking about two specific places and then a third one. The one place is a region, which is a territory. The shadow of death is a grave. So we have the shadows of death. Notice, again, I'll read. Sat in darkness, sat in region, sat in shadow of death. What is a shadow of death? When we put somebody into the grave, we now know that they have been under a shadow or are now under a shadow of an incident that actually happened. Their hearts stopped beating and now they're in the grave. So it's actually speaking about a location that can be and can look very much like a grave, like a place where you cannot get out of, a place that looks hopeless, a place where there is a dark upper hand that has ruled you and put you in this place. And there is no hope, seemingly. So we're talking territory and then also a shadow. A shadow is my hand is here and it will keep the light from shining down through that. Doesn't mean that there's not some light out here, but right under it, it divides the light that is to come upon me and it will not come on me. And so in that shadow, there is some darkness and there is some faint visibility. And if the shadow becomes very dark, you can almost see nothing. It's almost like a mist when you read the Word of God and the Word of God doesn't do anything. The Word of God is powerless. It has no power in your life. You can read it, and every time you look at the Bible and want to read it, it's, oh, i got to read a, if I could just read a chapter, then I'm fine. And it's not fun reading it because there's a shadow over your life that is blinding the truth, where it cannot penetrate in your heart and give you hope, and give you joy, and make you feel like a different person. This is how it should be. I'm just speaking honestly. When I read the Bible, I can't read much. 
I get so illuminated by it. This has been ever since I was baptized with the Holy Spirit. I read the Bible and it's like, oh, I get stuck in that one verse and I go, I start looking at and going back and forth. It's so meaningful. Somewhere the shadows have been removed. And I'd like to speak to you about that, about those shadows. It's speaking about the location. Now, a grave, it's a cloud like death, gloomy, doom, death that hovers over you. If it can go wrong, it will go wrong. If it will not work, it will not work for me. Some of these things, I remember that there was somebody in our community that made a statement, and he says that if a bird flies over top of anyone and it releases, uh, yeah, dirt, I am always the one that it falls upon. And then he also said, and he had a certain term to say that, and he also said, other people will always get more money. They can put something on auction and it'll always bring more. But my stuff will never bring more. It always brings less. And their whole farm was sold for I believe a fraction of the value. He got what he believed. Now we'll get into those things because there's some tight ropes to walk. What is a positive confession? Is that right or is it wrong? One thing that I know, that if you look at the description of this, the people that sat in darkness, they are also sat in the region and sat in the shadow of death. I notice one very thing that they all had in common. They sat. They sat. It was a standstill. Now David speaks about, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but he walked through it. These people sat. If you're sitting in a place of death, you're in a dangerous place. You're sitting and waiting. And basically all that you're getting is your expectation. This is what you expect in your heart. I expect bad, that's what's coming. You're sitting. You're not walking through it. And if I can encourage you people today to take a look at the condition you're in or what you're facing. And I'm aware that this message goes around, not just contained here. But look at your life, what you're facing. If you're going through difficulty, are you walking through it or are you sitting in it? You sit in the expectations, but when you walk, you walk away from and into. Walking from and into. And that itself offers hope. When you're sitting in a place where there is no hope, you're sitting. When you're walking, there is hope. That's why you're walking. Yeah? You're walking, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm walking through it. I'm making progress through it. I'm learning through it. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. This is a big thing. I hope you meditate on that. Hallelujah. When I look at the Bible and I look at how many times the word shadow of death comes up, there is only one book that has stood out to me above all the others. And in this book, there was nine times that it spoke about the shadow of death. Can you guess which book that is? By far more than any of the other books in the entire Bible. Can you tell me what that book would be? It's the book of Job. What happened in the book of Job? He was tested by who? The devil. The devil was in his regions and was very destructive to him. Yes, allowed by God. But in this, Job mentions nine times about the shadow of death. We don't read that in Psalms. It's quite the other story. 
Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits. Who heals you, who gives you life, keeps your life from destruction, crowns you with righteousness, many things. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Doesn't look like a valley of the shadow of death. But when you look at a person that has endured so much from the actual attacks of the devil, you'd have to conclude Job was the one that is most obvious. And he speaks more about the valley of the shadow of death than anybody else. So I would like to conclude that when you are dealing with the valley of a shadow of death, whether you're sitting in it or walking through it, the devil's on the scene. What are you going to do about it? Will you sit under him? Will you allow no light to come through? Or will you get up and start walking? I will instruct you how to start walking as this message continues. Hallelujah. In Psalms 107, such as sit in darkness and shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, speaks about this shadow of death, and it gives, and also sit in darkness, shadow of death, and then it says what well, the problem is, they're bound in affliction and in iron. Why? Then he explains, because they rebelled against the words of God and scorned the counsel of the Most High. How do you do that? Some preacher can stand before you or some man, some woman can come to you and say something about this is what God says and you'll just smirk at it. <laughs> Doesn't apply to me. That's all for other people but not for me. <laughs> Scorning at the counsel of God. Someone prophesies over you. Huh. It's not for me, it's for everyone else. Always goes bad for me. Scorning, laughing at the counsel of God. Now the counsel of God, in most of these times, comes to the human lips. Be careful what you laugh at. Be careful what you scorn at. Be careful what you degrade. Even in the message I'm speaking today, the devil already would like to have some of you diminish the importance of certain things I've said. It's a form of scorning. Scorning. And it says these people are bound in affliction and in iron. If you're in the valley of the shadow of death today, if this is describing your life, is it perhaps because you've turned away from counsel that God has given you, either directly from the, from the Word or His Word through the lips of a person or perhaps even through a book you read? But you knew it was God when He ordered something from you and you just kind of, Pah. who does he think he is? What does she think she is? She just thinks she's so spiritual. He just thinks he's so spiritual. But I see faults in that person. Next thing you'll know, mark my words. These are the words of God. You'll be bound in affliction and in iron and you can't get loose. Now, remember now that I have also counseled many, many, many people for many, many years. I'm not speaking in elementary terms. I have much experience and these, is, these are things that I have constantly met in people's lives. The Word of God is the Word of God. doesn't matter in what form it comes. It's the Word of God. Never to be scorned. Isaiah 61, 1. We'll switch gears a little bit here, and we'll get even more practical. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because He has anointed me to preach. Good tidings to the depressed. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to them that are bound. Why is the Spirit of God upon me? Because He has put oil on me. 
He has anointed me. Now, this is what it says. Because the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because. What's the because? Because is because he has placed oil on your life and that oil belongs to him. And he is not satisfied until that oil is used for his glory. You put yourself in a dormant state, which is a place where the devil would like to keep you and hold you. And this can all happen by shadows of death. Refusing counsel. The reason I can't walk away from God, the reason that I can't quit ministry, ministering, is because I was there when the oil was flowing all the way down over me. I remember that moment. And under that anointing of oil is where the Spirit of God, I can't get away from Him. And when I open my mouth, I recognize that there is much ministry that comes all the time, whether I'm in conversation, whether I'm even talking about regular things in this world. There's life that springs forth because there's oil in my life. Some of you have oil as well. And you know whether you have oil. This is why you cannot quit the Holy Spirit, if I can say it that way. I won't speak much on that, but it says here, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of prison. Now, I will speak specifically about proclaiming liberty today. That's the, that's the, because I could speak, I could take basically one, one of these subjects and make a message out of all of them and they'd all be important but our time is not that way so I chose the one that I felt was probably the most important and perhaps the most misunderstood preach good tidings to the suppressed and the pressed down to bind up who? the broken hearted to, pro- pro- uh, to, pro- sorry. to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of prisons to the bound, the opening of the blind eyes to the ones that sit in darkness and in prison houses. Now we go and we simply take the word proclaim liberty. Well, the word proclaim here means to call out and address by name. To call out and address by name. Hallelujah, this gets interesting. We don't want to miss this. It's not because I'm speaking. There's a lot of truth that will be unveiled to us here today. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Who is the high priest? Who is our high priest? Christ Jesus. What makes him my high priest? My confession. If there is no confession, there is no high priest. Now let's go and look at that. We want to look at the word profession and confession and declaration. And I tried to write some notes on it, and finally decided I'm going to just wipe the notes clean on that and speak out of my heart the way I understand it. But I think it's like this, people. I'm not a doctor, but if I would be a doctor and you would come to me and you would need a, uh, let's say a dentist. You need a tooth pull. And if under doctor practice, he has a certain tool that he uses to pull this tooth or to fill this tooth or to cap this tooth. But it's a tool for everything he needs to do the best work. He won't bring a pipe wrench to pull a tooth. He won't bring a pliers to do this. And if I need a shot, he's not going to do it with a fork. He has a proper tool for everything. And I think in the Christian life, we misunderstand this. We just think one thing works for everything. It's not necessarily that way. 
And I want, would like to clarify that. What is the difference? When do I need to use proclamation? When do I need to use confession? And when do I need to use declaration? Those are three specific tools that I believe has been given to us by God through the power of the Holy Spirit. You have a person that messes around in witchcraft and they come and ask forgiveness. You think they'll be set free? It's the, they can be set free, they can be forgiven for dabbling in the wrong thing, but will that set them free? Will that bring them liberty? Not the act of violation, but the stronghold that develops when someone does such a thing. Will that free someone from the stronghold? I know that I'm walking around on some fiery coals in this because some people have some very strong opinions of it. They think when you turn to Christ and you ask Jesus into your life, it takes care of everything. But why do I run across these people all the time that it didn't? One of the main things is because it was never declared that the things they did was from the evil one. See, if you mess around in witchcraft, like we can use the thing that is a common practice in this community that I've stood against for 40 years. That's water witching. Water witching, divining, divination to find water. Well, I quit it. I'm not doing it anymore. All right? <coughs> Excuse me. All right, I'm glad you quit. Have you asked the Lord to forgive you for doing it? Yes, I did. Are you free from it? Well, I'm not doing it anymore. But let me inquire into your life a little further. What are some of the problems you have been facing? Oh, and it doesn't take me very long. I see that you have been molested by demonic problems. By, and I, I could tell you story after story. Get a call. I have a, well, I'll give you an incident, the exact incident that happened. There's this lady. Many years ago in my young ministry, I was preaching revival messages and meetings down in Pennsylvania. And this stark, religious looking, kind of haughty lady came walking in and uh, they ushered her in and sat right over here on the side, her and her husband. And she looked, and I didn't have my button closed, which was the practice back then in that type of church. And afterwards, she contacted, and I spoke about, I think it was about demo, or, uh, witchcraft, things of this nature. It was toward the end of the revival meetings. I always had a message on kind of this, to bring the curious arts and things, and let's go and burn them. And this was, I believe, the message that was in that line. She sat there and resisted everything I said. And I could, I could just sense something coming from her of just... <clears throat> Don't like what you're talking about. I don't think you know what you're talking about. Just a real smart type of a, well, I continued, but I felt the resistance. Something you can feel. You can feel if someone's not receiving it. Very clearly, you get those vibes quick. Don't even have to see the person. Well, what happened is, this person went right up to the preacher afterwards and said, what kind of a cowboy you have preaching in here? We're not used to this type of stuff. Doesn't have his button closed, didn't have a straight cut. And he said, well, listen, I know he's out of the ordinary for what we're used to, but I know this man, and you can trust him. Just bear with us. Come tomorrow night again. Well, that tomorrow night came. She was there, was one of the first people to hit the altar. And she came up. <laughs> I wish I wouldn't be so, so tender-hearted sometimes, but I can still see her. She could barely walk. She was so broken. She was weeping, her husband, hand in hand as they come. And she said, you just described my life. We were missionaries down in Guatemala with Mennonite Air Missions. And there was a young person that got converted in this one village. 
And the witch doctor stood up and said that I will cast you out of this country. You will have all your money taken from you and did a whole description of their life. You will be sick. You will be in, filled with infirmity. And this will be your life. And she snapped back and they didn't said, you can't touch us. We're bought by the blood of Jesus. And she says, everything that witch doctor said happened to us. They were born again. I questioned their new birth. They were born again. What happened? As they were down here, and I was dealing with them, I finally took them back to another room. And then I asked her, do you recall? See, see if that curse could come on her, she had an open door or on them. There was a door that was open. Satan could just come in there and make that kind of havoc. And she said, no. Were you ever involved in witchcraft? I questioned, no. Sorcery, no. None of that. Well, that's where you have to turn to the Lord and say, Lord, show me. Many times, I can tell you stories that would almost take your hair straight up from nights of working and dealing with people that were under these types of bondages. Um, maybe as time goes on, we'll, we can tell some of those stories. But I just, something tells me that there was, there's divining in your life somewhere. Have you ever inquired how many children you're going to have? And she was, got this horrified look and she said, oh my, I'm a nurse. And while I was getting my education, the nurses one night sat around a table with the Ouija board and we asked if we're going to have children, how many boys, how many girls? I said, did you ask that? He said, yeah, but I'm a Christian. No. What we did, we renounced that in the name of Jesus. How do you renounce it? We made a declaration. That's from the devil. And I will have no part in the devil. I close that door now through the power of Jesus so that the devil cannot do anything through that. And I separate myself from him. They called me a year ago, a, a year later, and said that in all our experience up until this point, we were fairly wealthy to their standards at that time. They said... A year later, we have had the best financial year we have ever had in our life, and everything we lost was completely restored. Notice, you could have asked, Lord, forgive me for doing that. But it was not declared as from the devil. And the devil is a legal expert. He knows he's like, it's, He's like a lawyer. He knows the law. And he knows where there is a door left open. And he'll try to come in there in any way he can. This is just one little example that I can give you of the importance of declaration. What did I do? I proclaimed liberty to them. This will not go on. This will stop. I proclaim you will be set free tonight. It's a proclamation. I've done this on numerous cases. Even preaching the word, picking somebody out in the back and saying, it's on my heart to proclaim to you, you will be set free. And sometimes I've even addressed the very person by name. You will be set free. That's a proclamation. The Bible says how to deal with those that are in prison? Pro proclaim liberty to the captives. I hear people, Christian people, good-meaning people, oh, I feel so bad for you. Oh, I feel so bad. I'd do anything I could to help you. Just, 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 oh, I just, I feel so bad for you. That's not proclaiming liberty might be showing love, but it's not going to work. When you are a captive, you're in a place where you cannot get out. You're in a place where you cannot escape. You're held tight. You're in a place where there is no hope. 
proclaim liberty to the captives. And he gave men the gifts to do it when he died and went into that grave. Proclaim liberty to the captives and he gave gifts unto men. This is really important that we see this. Deliverance and speaking proclamation is not only for the preacher. It's for God's children. These are tools. I've learned that in my dealing with people, in some of the first words somebody says, I can already know whether they're going to be set free or not. Because you can hear what they say. What they're saying is prison language. They're not open for help. They want excuse and sympathy. They will not be set free. If what you want is sympathy and excuse to continue where you're at, you're in prison. You can hear it. You want to be pitied. You want that position to be strengthened where you're at. God will not set you free from your friends, only from your enemies. And until they become your enemies, the situation that holds you, until that becomes your enemy, you will not be set free. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession. So who is our high priest? Why do I need a high priest? See, the only way back in the Old Testament, and it still stands to this moment, the only way that you could come into the presence of Almighty God was through a high priest. And that high priest would only once a year enter into the presence of God. And as I explained the last time, last Sunday, on the blood, of, the blood that was needed, something had to be slaughtered. We now have a spiritual high priest. That spiritual high priest is Jesus the Christ. But he will not be your high priest until there is a confession. So I'm asking you today whether you have a high priest. Do you have a high priest? Is there someone making the contact you, making the contact for you to the higher and highest authority, which is the Father? Jesus is that high priest. Until we open this profession mouth, confession mouth, and make confession part of your profession, he cannot, his hand is held. You can tell us, you can say a thousand times, Lord, help me. But until you confess and profess. Now, the word profess comes very close into proclamation. And this is what I, this is exciting. Uh, very exciting to speak about this because this really works. Hallelujah. As does the entire Bible. Hallelujah. What does the word confession mean? Let's distinguish between confession acknowledgement and uh, proclamation. The word profession, consider the high priest, our profession or acknowledgement, that it basically means confession in a different sense. We make the words of our mouth agree with the word of God. This is what it is. Profession is, I make the words of my mouth agree with the Word of God. Amen? Because the Word stands. It has been written. And it will never be rewritten. It won't be added to or taken away. It's the complete, complete book. Complete counsel of God. It's final from the top, from the front to the back. That is it. Now, we agree with this word, by profession. I profess. How many of you are professing Christians? How many of you are confessing Christians? See a difference? Mm -hmm. I rarely see a new person that I look at, well, I think they are 
confessing Christians, I say professing Christians. You hold on to a profession, and that profession is the Word of God. What this Word says, I repeat, I bring myself not, and I'm going to speak a little bit about this Word that has been extremely troublesome for me for some years now. See, I'm old enough to look back and remember when some of these things started. I hear this thing. We need to bring ourselves in alignment with God. That is not scriptural. I do not bring myself in alignment. I bring myself in surrender to God. Alignment is not the right word. It, I can take a, a car that is not aligned in the front, known as a front end alignment, and I can still get down to New Philly. Not a problem. But if I'm not, if that vehicle is not surrendered to do what I tell it to, I will not get there. There is a big difference. We are asked to surrender ourselves to God. Not align. When you surrender, if you want to use the word align, you are completely aligned. Because God never in his word ever, anywhere that I could find these years has ever asked me to align myself with his word. But he's asked me many times and in the power of the cross to surrender my life to him. And when I'm surrendered, I'm completely aligned if that's what you're looking for. But because you can align doesn't mean you're surrendered. You see, surrender to me means death. Align does not. Align means manipulate. Well, I'll just do this way just a little bit. Has nothing to do with the cross. And I think it's one of these technical terms that the enemy can use as an advantage to misguide, take person the wrong way. But you will never be misguided by surrendering, surrendering your life to Christ and the power of Christ and his word. And in this is where I see that there's these little manipulations start coming. That you can think a little this way, you can think a little that way. We need to align ourselves with the purpose of God. No, we need to surrender ourselves to the purpose of God. And when I'm surrendered, I'm as a lamb taken to the slaughter. When I'm aligned, nothing really has changed. I can align myself a little bit with this. Okay, now I'll be able to do this. But it doesn't mean everything else is complete. The danger of using that word is tremendously bothersome to me. When I use the word in proclamation, and when you get into the fine details of dealing with devils and demons in people's lives, these words do not work. Satan can try to make you think, well, you need to align yourself a little bit with this. No, you surrender yourself to Christ. You surrender your will to Christ. You surrender your ways to Christ. And in this there is power. I see no resurrection power coming from alignment, but I see all kinds of resurrection power coming from surrender. Do you hear me? The Bible asks us to surrender ourselves. Jesus came and surrendered himself to do the will of God. He didn't align himself. I think it's a modern term that can be very, very deceptive. And I think most people don't really want to use it as a deceptive frame. But it's a dangerous, it's very dangerous into what I understand and how I have walked with God and have understood people and where they have walked trying to find victory in their lives. After all, isn't that one of the things that we're all so looking for in our own lives, to walk in victory, to walk under the power of the Holy Spirit, to walk in the presence of God? Amen. So, hallelujah, this can only come. We make the words of our mouth agree with the word of God. This is exactly what, and alignment will not do that. Surrender will. This can only come from divine, it's divine surrendered heart. Now Jesus becomes our apostle and high priest. We are now brought under his full authority, a slight 
alignment on one little detail. We can look at it, if I could somehow make a case for something. Say, for instance, it's a violation in the Bible to wear my glasses upside down. And I refuse to do it the other way because this is the fad right now, and this is what I want. I will do this, and God will say, well, okay, somebody will tell me, just align yourself. Well, right now, if I refuse to do this, I'll have a heart problem. But if you would just align that, all right, all right. I'm wearing it the other way. A slight alignment had nothing to do with my surrendered heart. Are you seeing this picture? It's the same thing that bothers me at times when someone prays like this. Lord Jesus, thank you for being here. We bless you. We ask that you would continue. And thank you for this food and meal that we are about to partake. We pray in his name. We're never asked to say his name in a prayer conclusion. We are to pray in the name of Jesus. It's not in your name. It's in Jesus' name. Try casting out demons in your name or in his name. No. We are given the name Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. And it's Jesus' name that the devil can't handle. His name, that name, those names. It's the name of Jesus that we cannot avoid. It's these legal things that when you get into real conflict with proclamation over a person that needs to be set free or a person that has demonic problems or a person that has unusual health issues, things of all different things that we'll get into at some point, not today, but as time gives at a later message. We need to learn to use the words that have been written. We don't come in alignment. We come in surrender to the entire word. And we use these words because they are legal. This is how we find victory. Hallelujah. Confess or confession means to say as is, already spoken. So, let's have a plaintiff at the court. And then we have the defender. And the plaintiff says, you have stolen my car. All right? And the defendant says, I have not. So the plaintiff makes a declaration you have, but the person that has accused or the defendant now says, I have not d done that. Or in the court under a judge, you would be asked, would you, how will you make your plea? You only have several options. One option is no contest. That means the court needs to decide. I'm not going to say yea or nay. The other one says not guilty. The other one says guilty. And until you say guilty, I mean, the evidence is all there. You've stolen the car. And the evidence is completely there. Until you have said guilty, that then is a confession. Now, based on that confession, it is written on a piece of paper that is known as a declaration. You have declared you have stolen it by your confession. Now, what does profession look like? In the realm of these legalities, we're speaking about profession. And this will get interesting as time goes on. I tried to explain that in the simplest form I could think of. Remember, confess or confession means to say the same as. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to deliver you, forgive you and deliver you from all unrighteousness. But it has done by not profession, not by declaration, but by confession. I confess that I'm a sinner. Now you can write that down. I've had people do that already, that later on go in their lives and they come and they question whether they've ever been born again. When I see it's that type of a person, I tell them, go in the back front of your Bible and write this down, that on this day I gave my life to Jesus and I became born again. I confess this and write it down. 
And you sign your name and I'll sign right below it. There's Bibles across the U.S. that have my name in that for that reason. For people that have given their lives to Christ that I thought later on with knowing a little bit perhaps of what I saw in dealing with them that they might question this later on. And my signature is in there as well as theirs. That is a declaration based on a confession. When we're doing and talking about proclamation, we're talking about something completely different. Pro proclamation is to herald. May it be known. May it be known. And the Bible says this is how people that are in prison need to be handled. Be it known, you will be set free. Proclamation. Proclaim liberty to the captives. May God help you and us to use this powerful tool. The man that came up and laid his hand on my shoulder and looked me squarely in the eyes with kind of a low voice. And he said, I have a word of prophecy. And then he prophesied prophesied and on the prophecy he proclaimed and when he proclaimed it was as though it was he did so about eight years later what he proclaimed right over me literally happened we are to proclaim liberty to the captives if you are held captive by anything today and God knows and you know. If you know someone that is bound and, and is captive, our tool is to proclaim liberty, not sympathy. We have so many good-meaning Christian people that if anything, they even add bounds to someone's bounds and offer less hope because all we can offer is, I really pity you. I wish it wouldn't be this way. I proclaim to you by the authority of Jesus Christ in his promises, you will be set free. Now I will take you through the formality of this in a much deeper way if we want to follow me. Hallelujah. Before I go that far, let me just read a couple of my notes. If you have no confession, you have no active high priest. If you close your mouth without confession or a wrong confession, you have no high priest. The air of misunderstanding, negative confession and positive confession. And I want to speak a little bit about that. I've been down every road. I believe, or close to every road that was offered in my early years, one of these ones that is just simply wrong. And I want you to hear me out before you conclude. Somebody's coughing over here. Who was that? May I know who that was? Okay. How many of you agree that was a cough? You know, there's people that would say, no, no, you can't admit it. Because if you admit you cough, you're agreeing with the devil. Where do you read something like that? Huh? I'm going to talk about this. I, got, I was introduced to this stuff years ago. But those are the very people that as soon as they get healed, they walk around and say, Jesus healed me. Healed me from what? Something I didn't have. No? No, no, no. I believe this is false doctrine. Be very honest with you. Jesus came to heal the sick. And the Bible tells us we do not lie against the truth. I know I've been told right to my face on numerous times, down through time, on this hay fever thing that I used to have. And I know there's a thin line here. But hachu, hachu. No, I don't have hay fever. Hachoo! I sneeze again. My eyes water. Got to wear a mask. Yep, yeah, if you take that mask off and just walk. I remember one of the great sayings that God allowed me to know. One of the dearest friends 
of Leonard Ravenhill. His name was Bracy Greer. He came to me one day and he said, Wayne, I do have a question for you. And he said, I was in a healing meeting. And in this healing meeting, they told us that the reason you're not being healed is because you haven't thrown your glasses away. Because Jesus said, take up your bed and walk. All right? So somehow we need to throw the glasses to be healed. I will be honest with you people. Jesus has more power than is in these glasses and whatever I do with them. Because him whom the Son sets free shall be free indeed. Healing is not in what I do. It's in my profession. It's in my proclamation. Does Jesus heal? There's others that are this far away, the other way. Well, I don't want to really ask the Lord to heal me because maybe it's not his will. This is another problem. The Lord healed me after I made a confession and proclaimed over my life that it is always his will to heal. Then my hay fever was gone. Now it is a really interesting thing that when I went to a specialist and he did all kinds of tests over my body to see what I'm allergic to, find out that I'm very allergic to ragweed, but I have no hay fever from it. Now tell me how that is. And I guess in the technicalities where I asked the Lord to, to, to uh, heal me from hay fever, I never asked him to take the allergies away. And he healed my hay fever. I don't have hay fever anymore. Fifty some years of it. And I have masks back here in this room that I brought out here on display that I used to wear for many years being on the outside. And one day when I said, it is always your will to heal, then I saw, well, then in that case, I am healed. For by his stripes ye were healed, past tense. Yeah? You were healed from what? Sickness. If you can't confess sickness, there's nothing to heal from. This is wrong, people. This has to do with positive confession. This I've learned back in the 70s was a very prevalent move known as with the hippie movement or the super, Jesus superstar movement. And finally it got so wild that even Jesus was left out of the scene and just became positive confession. Am I saying that negative and positive confession cannot have influence? Absolutely it will have influence. But healing is not in that. Healing is in Jesus. It's in the power of the blood. It's in what Jesus has done. And don't tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about. If I can be honest with you, I don't know all of you, but if I can be honest with you, and maybe humble enough to say this, that God has used my hands to heal more people than probably any of you that he's ever used in that. So it's not that I'm saying the wrong thing. I'm not saying it in a braggadocious way. I'm saying it, listen to experience. I've heard people say that to me. Don't say that, don't say that, don't say that. That hurts, that hurts. Well, it hurts. The Bible says don't lie against the truth. God will not take it. They didn't bring the person that, uh, that they brought down through a roof to heal by uh, Jesus to have him healed. He didn't walk in. He came as a cripple. He came as a person that could not walk. The people that came with leprosy, they had leprosy. They didn't say, I don't have leprosy, I don't have leprosy. That is the 70s movements that I remember so clearly. And with David Wilkerson and my experience with them, they have went through that same path where it comes as positive confession, which then, <coughs> excuse me, to one point, ties right into known as transcendental meditation, which today we know it as yoga. And I will speak about that at some other message. What is yoga? And what is this positive confession? For then Jesus even is taken out of the scene. Proclamation is something that has to do with God and his already spoken word. Remember that. And we as God's children 
agree and confess with that which already is. So when the Bible says in Peter, um, bless the Lord on my soul and forget not his benefits, who healeth, no, doesn't, that's in Psalms, um, who healeth all thy diseases. I wish I could turn to it. I got myself in a little bit of a uh, bind there. Where is that verse, Lord? Um, let me see. Can someone remember it? If not, we'll move on for time's sake. But the Bible says in Peter, talks about, yeah, someone has it? So, yeah, that's uh, in the Old Testament. There's one in Peter that said he has, um, oh, I just can't get it. I've repeated so many times, and right now I'm blank. Um, huh. Well, do I go on a hunt, or will I make the message shorter because I'm taking some time to look this up? Uh, come on. I, let me see, talks about who, here it is. Thank you. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, and we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Were is past tense. And then I said, well, Jesus, in that case, I'm healed from hay fever. And the only way that I will have it again is you will it back to me. Because I now see I'm free from it. And I just said, Lord willing, I will have hay fever. For years I said, Lord willing, I will not have hay fever. Now I said, Lord willing, I'll have hay fever. Because he has to will it back. Because it was healed. This is found in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. Uh, 24. By whose stripes you were healed. So if you were healed, it was past tense. In order to bring it back, he has to will it again. And there's where I was healed. Think of this, 50 some years, sneezing in the crib when I was a young baby already, according to mom. Let's move on. Let's talk about proclamation. Psalms 33, 6. By the word of the Lord, were the, this is some good stuff, people. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. You see, where God moves is when you use the word of the Lord and the breath of his mouth, which is the Holy Spirit. In a meeting where I preached this message, probably... I would say 18 years ago, I was using this verse and speaking this word when a lady jumped up sitting over in this area in another building. She jumped up and she just puts her hand up like this, said, I will have, I will have a new job and I will have a better paying job. Sat back down. And I know it gripped me at the moment I said, I thought, no, you can't just blurt out anything. It has to be according to the word. You agree with that which was spoken. Or the Holy Spirit and the word. I'm here to tell you to this day, that was a girl that used, I used to kind of be embarrassed about her. She was always changing jobs. She could never get anywhere in life because she was jumping from this one to that one to this one to this one. Like common news, oh, another job. Just lasted two, three months, another job, another job. Let me tell you something today. She's a nurse. She's a good nurse. I would have never even thought, I don't think she did, that she would ever want to be a nurse. Steve, that's your sister. It's your sister that said that. Is this summed up? I believe she was led by the Holy Spirit to release, and that was a proclamation. It was later that her feet were turned and she went to nursing school, and today she's a good nurse. 
being paid well. What she spoke is exactly where she is. In Hawaii right now, celebrating with my oldest son's wife in Hawaii, and they're probably watching this service. Be careful what you speak. And be careful to speak when he asks you to. That is proclamation. I proclaim. I will have a better job. Anybody could say that. But for some reason, it seemed the Holy Spirit must have whelmed up in her. And she just got up. She would not be the typical one to do that. And she just said that. I can still see her right in this area with her hand like this. And I was like, no, we don't just blot, blurt out anything. It has to be by the Holy Spirit. But I'm here to tell you there's many times where I have said something by the Holy Spirit and his word and it happened. The Bible even says this is how the worlds were framed by the Spirit and by the word. And the Bible says that it is by the Spirit and by the word that it is contained even now in suspense. And the Bible even says it is by the Spirit and the word that it'll come to an end and God will do it all. So the reason that the planets are all going in this motion, in the motion that they're going, and staying in their path, and all at once we get news from a comet that is about to visit our planet and go past here, where we'll be able to see here in the first of next month. And it's never been seen by man, and if it would have been in the speed and everything they track, it would have been 50,000 years ago according to their figures. There's things out there that we know nothing about. They're all held in suspense by the Spirit of God and by the Word of God. And it's by the Spirit of God and by the Word of God that I walk with God, that you walk with God, that you have salvation. It is by the Spirit of God and the Word of God that you can be healed, that life can be different, that you can be set free. I was a man such as that, that needed deliverance. But proclaimed upon me was the word of God, and it became truth when I believed it in my own heart. The devil wants you to question the things you say. The devil wants to bring you in places that look so impossible that you only want to believe what he is showing you. Then you come across the word of God, and by the power of the Spirit, you confess it becomes that. I have powerful things that I could tell you. My whole trip to Saudi Arabia, and I cannot believe almost now, it's difficult for me. When I was over there, everybody dressed black. It was black everywhere. Most of the women, you could just see their eyes. This was just, what, three, four years ago. And it seemed, I, God sent me over there because he gave me the conviction of being Abraham's seed and therefore having Abraham's feet. And part of that land was promised to Azure. But that was part of the land was never given to him. And Lord put a conviction on my heart to start praying for that land. And so that that land would be set free through some of the difficult things I went through through that time. Out of obedience went over there one day being the first evangelical group that was ever invited to go into Saudi Arabia for hundreds of years. And now I look at pictures being sent over now. It's completely different. My, I looked at the pictures this morning. Some of them were sent overnight. And I was like, I just can't believe it's the same country. Men and women are eating together in restaurants. When I went over, impossible. You cannot do that. It was a law. Men cannot serve women. Women cannot serve men. Restaurants had compartments. Women on one side, men on the other side. That has all been removed. Women could not drive cars. Uh, proclamation. 
proclamation based on the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Now, I have to move on. Um, Isaiah 55, verse 10. How does this come, people? When, when God speaks to you with his word, what happens? Some of you will be receptive to it. Others of you, it's like a cold chill going through here. I don't like this. It doesn't feel good. I don't like this. It's not for me. You just want to shake it off. But when the word of God comes, this is how it comes. Hear me. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not again, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, bread to the eater. So the word of God that brings bread to you as an eater and seed to you as a sower, it comes in these two forms, as rain or as snow. Now to some of you who are sitting here and you sense a rain, your ground is open. To others of you, this is, this is just cold. I don't like it. I don't think this is for me. This is how the Bible comes to us. And what it asks us to do is be patient. Hallelujah. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it will accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing where it I send it. So if you're sitting here today and feeling and sensing this as snow, and it brings you in a cold place, or as rain in a nutritious way. If it's snow, wait it out. Sooner or later, it will come. I remember sitting in meetings many years ago, and I'd sit there and I'd say, God, I have so much to learn. I don't know these things. I don't even know. I don't receive revelation from you. And it's like cold. It was like snow. It's like I hear it, just like I hear it, but it's doesn't do anything to me. Wait it out. When that snow melts, the Bible says it will produce buds from the seed. Now look what happens. This is how it works. Hallelujah. Bring forth and bud. Let's see some flowers in your life. Let's see some flowers. Let's allow it to nourish your faith. Let's allow it to nourish you in seeing it scripturally the way the Bible says it so that you become powerful agents of his glory. There's no exemption forms. There's nobody in here that doesn't qualify if you have Jesus in your life. Father, make that it's rain to me. And if it's snow, I'll be patient to let it melt so that I might be changed in your image so that I can glorify you here in this world. <coughs> Excuse me. Seed to the sower, bread to the eater. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Lord. <coughs> He's kept my voice well. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return until I, I read that. And then, no, I'll read it on, then I want to continue. Look at this. So, sh oh, hallelujah, this is good. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing where I have sent it. Verse 12. For ye shall go out with joy, and be led forth with peace, and the mountains and the hills that look so tall and sometimes so impossible, they will break before you and into singing. These big mountains that look so evil, they look so impossible, all at once become a song of your life. Hallelujah. They become a song in your life. And the trees of the field will clap their hands. All at once, the trees in your life won't look as difficult, and it'll give you a clap, clap. Let's keep on going. Today, the trees of the field are clapping in your lives. Keep on going. 
You're going the right way. You're hungering for the right thing. Proclaim it. Proclaim it over yourself. Hallelujah. And the next verse. Instead of the thorn that often pricks me shall come forth the fir tree. The word fir simply interprets as lance. A lance is a musical instrument. And instead of the briar that pricks me, briars everywhere where there's a little empty space, a briar will just come up. Things just to come against me. Instead of that, the myrtle tree. The word myrtle means it's an evergreen that always blooms. It's an evergreen. Whether it's in the cold of the winter or in the heat of the summer, it's evergreen. This is what happens when the word comes to you. You will ever be green. There's life written all over you, always, all the time. And it shall be to the Lord for a name and for an everlasting sign and shall not be cut off. This is what the word does for you. Receive it by the power of his spirit through the spoken word. Repeat it through proclamation. I turn to several more verses in Zechariah chapter eight, verse, uh, eight, 1, verse 8. I saw in the night, and behold, a man riding on a horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees. We say now, rather than thorns or briars, it's myrtle trees. My surroundings are myrtle trees. That even in the cold or in the extreme heat, they're the same tree. And there's always flowers there. Among the myrtle trees in the glen and behind him were a red sorrel and white horse, or horses. Verse 9, then I said, what are these, my Lord? And the angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. Verse 10, so the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, these are they whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. Hallelujah. People receive the word of God. Don't be picky. Don't say it's impossible for me. It doesn't belong to me. Take the word, eat it, confess it, proclaim it, receive it. So that the thorns, some of you have thorns in your marriage. Prick each other. Let the word come. Proclaim it over your household. Proclaim it to the rooms. Proclaim it over the children. Proclaim it wherever you are. Proclaim it over the husband. Proclaim it over the wife. Proclaim it to your generation. Keep proclaiming, keep proclaiming, keep proclaiming. We proclaim liberty to the captives. We proclaim it to the captives, to the generation. I proclaim this, God knows, often over my generation, to children and children's children that I will never see. I proclaim liberty over them. I proclaim God's blessing over them. I proclaim God's drawing over them. I proclaim God's healing over them. I proclaim the success of heaven over them. Hallelujah. The power of proclamation. We agree which that which has been said, has been written, and we speak it out. We herald it. That's what proclamation means. We herald it. If there's a husband-wife problem, we're back and forth. No, you just said that. No, you did not. Yes, you did. No, 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 no. Boom, door slams its seal. That's what you have in the home. That's what you'll see in the generation. That's proclamation. But it's not by the Spirit of God. Now start confessing with the Spirit of God. It is confessing with the Spirit of God that has even brought the world into existence. Proclamation ties that mind is saying the opposite. I'm in this hole, I can't get out, I'll never get out, it looks so hopeless. The whole world's been against me, my parents were not against me, I was mistreated. Stop proclaiming that. 
Proclaim liberty to yourself. I've been forgiven. I'm under the blood of Christ. God has made the provision, and you can take a lot of verses and proclaim them. And you do it by the power of the Spirit. So how do you do it by the power of the Spirit? Well, we know that the word Spirit simply means air. I've tried to find other words for the word Spirit, and I can't find it. Holy Spirit just says, holy breath of air. Holy, well, is that something I can have? Yes, I do believe I have the Holy Spirit. So now, breathe it out. You can't confess without having an air movement. Something has to move out of here. Try confessing something like this. Confession is when air mixes and goes through your vocal cords and you make a statement. And the Bible says, I can confess my sins that way, he'll forgive them. Proclamation is the same thing. This lady that was sitting here and making that statement, I will have a better job. She was tired of being poor, looking for something better, and just, I will have a better job. Must have spoken by the Spirit of God, and she got the better job. Hallelujah. Isn't this something? But I found myself that time when I stood here in this church and I dismissed all the people and, all, and I knew there was something that the Spirit of God was telling me to say. It was burden on me and I knew I need to, but it was embarrassing. I didn't want to do that. So I just dismissed the people and, and said, no, I can't get away with this because this will haunt me because I was disobedient. And I said, just a minute, and some of you remember, just a minute, I have something to say yet. And I proclaim to those that could not have children that they will have children. I proclaim that wombs will be open. And I think out of that, three sets of twins were born and close to 20 babies were born in this church. It was by the Spirit of God, it wasn't me, it was by the Spirit of God, the Word of God. Some of you will say, well, you can be really reckless. I wish you would start being reckless ones with this. That's what the devil would like to have you believe. Just, you're too reckless with this. Yeah, but it, yeah, he tries to tell you that. And once you do it, it's like, yeah, that was a mistake. No, it was not. It was by the Spirit of God and by the breath coming out of my system, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I walked in obedience and I did that. So I have prayed for many people concerning things, and they were healed, and prayers were answered. Proclaim liberty to the captives. When we get into this next phase of the message where we'll name these things, ties that bind, we need this. I cannot tell you you'll be set free if I don't believe it and confess it to you. Amen? It's proclamation to the ones and tonight, uh, today, I would like to pray a prayer yet, a proclamation to that. Um, let's just take another little look at these people that are no more have briars in their lives, and, but they're now with a myrtle tree, and their life, rather than, be, than being a thorn, becomes a musical instrument. Jesus. Look at this picture. There's everything you could complain about and have all kinds of authority to complain about. But you choose because the word of God has changed you. It might have been cold like snow, saw no purpose in it. But you allow it to, allowed it to melt on your life. And today, it's turned you around. And that word became effective. There are some of you that I know are sitting here. I don't know it by personality, by personally. But I know it by the spirit. You are taking this message and letting it run right off of you because you think you're too hopeless and you're too not a special, or you're too an unspecial person, if there's a word like that, for this word to be you. I was one of those people. There is nobody here today under the sound of my voice that cannot be changed by the power and the authority of the spoken word, if you believe. 
And if you find it hard to believe, receive it. It might be like that cold snow on a cold night. Or it might be rain that just goes right into that hungry ground. And right now the buds will start coming up and start blooming. And that which used to really bother you becomes your musical instrument. And that which pricks you will put you in a place where God will make you a patrol over the earth. Because you walk with the myrtle trees. Isn't this beautiful? I'm not speaking anything outside my own experience. So I'm not speaking about some foreign things. This is what I've experienced. And if I can experience this, so can you. There's no exemption and no exception. Believe and receive the importance of proclamation. One set of verses yet? Hebrews chapter 4. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is past. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I've spoken about this verse before. I want to repeat it. That is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast. Let's hold fast our profession. Let's not waver in this. You are not the wrong exception. You are not the weak one. You're not the one this doesn't belong to. This belongs to everyone. Let's hold it fast. Let's hold it fast. Let us hold fast the profession, Hebrews 10, 23, of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. He is faithful that promised. Hold fast this profession. Start proclaiming it over your life. Some of you have lived in poverty. And when I'm saying poor, poor, no, I'm not saying that. But stricken constantly with the idea it will never go well with you. Start proclaiming. And if the worship team would come forward this time, please come. We're at almost 12, not quite. Start proclaiming something in your home. Start, start doing something different than what you have been doing. Some of you might say, well, it's so hopeless. I see absolutely no way out, nothing different. Because this is what my history says. This is what our family history says. But my family history going back is not what my family history looking forward shall look like when you profess, when you proclaim. For some years, my children all turn out wrong. Is that what you want to continue to believe and say? My children and my generation, as for me and my house, there is the word, there is the promise. We will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, may it be known to the man that had a wavered son, went out way far away from his own state one night, Woke up in the middle of the night because his son ran away and nobody knew where he was. He was gone now, my understanding, for several years. One night, under the inspiration and burden from the Holy Spirit, this father walked out and he looked to the north, and I'm not sure on my directions here, looked to the north and he said, Come home to the east. Come home to the south. Come home to the west. Come home. A week later, there was a knock on the door. His son came home. Proclamation. Spoken by the power of the Spirit. It was God's will that he was home. Spoken by the power of the Spirit. I don't know that the man had to have a certain feeling to say that. He just wore a certain burden. And you might have exactly that. God mantles us, not with feelings, but with burdens. And when you have a burden,
Remember this, people. God showed me something where I was so under distress because my nerves were, and you could say I wasn't trusting God, perhaps that way, but I didn't understand. But God has been teaching me something. He's been telling me for these messages, Father, so what do you want me to speak about to you today? Because you're more concerned than I am. I am concerned that the message goes forth, but you are more so, because you're the head of the church. And you tell me to put my yoke on you, so I'm yoked with you. What can I do for you today? Most of us people come to Jesus being beggars and saying, Jesus, help me, help me, help me. I think it's time to turn it around. Jesus, how can I help you? What can I do for you today? Because you're the biggest horse in the team. Think that one through. We're always begging him, always begging him. And that's okay. But I think all at once we need to know we do have a lot of things that we don't have. And it's time we become his assistants. Because he is here. Where two or three are gathered together, there he is. So what can I do? Jesus, what can I do for you today? Jesus says, proclaim to the ones that need liberty. So what do I do? I proclaim liberty. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Yeshua, hallelujah, Jesus, Jesus, the power of Jesus, the high priest, I come to you. I confess you to be my high priest. I agree with your word. I agree with the power to proclaim that which already has been spoken to go out. I speak to those that are in prison. I speak to those that are bound. I speak to those that need to be set at liberty. I proclaim to them liberty. And so I speak to you over this group and to all that are hearing today. If this seed touches your heart or moves upon your heart, receive it. I proclaim liberty to you. I proclaim liberty to you. You will not always be like this. You will not always struggle like this. You will not always be the tail, but you will be the head. I speak to you that. You will not always be the one that gets the underhand. You will be the one that shines. You will be the one that brightens up the corners. You will be the one that is that the myrtle tree will come into your life and the musical instrument, that which has pierced you and that which has hurt you will turn into a musical instrument and you will be the one that is sent around to look at the condition and patrol the earth. And I speak to the patrols that are here this day, Father. Make them patrols. Let us, let the patrols see the condition that how everything is. Put awareness around them, O oh Father. I ask that, O oh God, we would be planted and we would walk among the myrtle trees, and that we would not hold any grudge or any unforgiveness toward anyone. Father, we proclaim and we confess Everyone that has ever hurt us, everyone that has ever done wrong to us, we forgive, and we forgive by name. They will not hurt us anymore, nor will we hurt them anymore. Hallelujah, Jesus. Today I proclaim liberty to the captive. If you are captive here, I proclaim liberty over you by the power of the Spirit. Come out of your grave. Come out of that place that looks hopeless. It will not always look like that. Hallelujah, 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 Father. I pray that the rain and the snow would do its work in its time. I pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen. And if we're singing up here, if you need to come just as a surrender walk, come walk up here, that's fine. I don't know all the songs, Faithful and Come Like a Flood, there's three of them. Come and just let God deal with whatever he wants. Maybe, some, maybe somebody here needs to just stand up and have a walk of proclamation. You just walk right up here. I'm going to walk out of this. I'm going to stay here. You might be the most faithful one or the most unfaithful one here. This is open for you. Amen. Thank you.
you.
Hallelujah. I have just a few things that I'd like to share. Uh, first of all, the, Wayne, I bless you for bringing the message to us today and the importance of the word that was spoken today. Um, uh, what was spoken today is very important, absolutely important in a believer's life. Because you, one, of the, one, of the, one of the great differences between us and animals is we can speak. God made us in his image. And we have a mouth that we can speak. And we can, we can transmit thought from one person to another. The animals can't really do that in that way. And we are made in the image of God. Um, uh, without, I, I don't want to, I have some things on my heart I want to share just very briefly. We need to understand that we are the agents of God here in this world. We're priests, kings and priests. And it is part of our calling that wherever we go, the importance of our mouth and the authority that can come from our mouth because we are under the authority of God. If we can see and understand this, the impacts that we can have in the world wherever we go, and it comes through words that come from our mouth. That's well, so important that our words agree with God, and that our heart is surrendered, and that our words agree. Wherever we go, you can have an impact Amen. with people, but not only with people, but the unseen forces where you go. You can. You have the right as children of God that where your feet go, you can claim it for the kingdom of God. Amen. Where the sole of your foot steps, whether it's an evil place or a place that needs deliverance, you can with your mouth say, I claim this place for the kingdom of God. Amen. And there's spiritual things that move in the heavenlies. Every one of us is called to this as believers. Some in one capacity, some in another, in our homes, and so on. I just want to impress upon you the importance of what was preached today. And it reminds me a little bit of what the Lord showed me about a year and a half ago, of how we bring environment where we go. And it invites, it either invites the presence of God or the presence of evil. And it's so important. The words, what environment do your words create? Or bring wherever you go. We can bring the presence. We are called to bring the presence of God wherever we step. Amen. Are you having trouble in your job? Because people are not. Bring the presence of God. Bring the environment where he's welcome. This is his kingdom. It is. We are the kingdom. We're part of that kingdom. Where we walk, the kingdom walks. And from our mouth, from your mouth, from my mouth. It's, I, I, yeah, amen, brother. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this. I believe we're at the verge of beginning to see something. I do. And, I, and I'll go back to, again, about a year and a half ago, I was, I was praying one morning. It was after a, a, a great change the Lord brought into my life and a deliverance. And I was ministering before the Lord, and what I saw so I saw this place, I saw this platform, and I didn't necessarily even see a person. But what I saw is I saw a cloud, a white cloud. It came out like a waterfall across these steps, and it went out over the congregation, and it covered the, co the congregation, and then it went out through the doors and into the valley. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And I say that in faith today. I saw that. I saw that in the spirit. I saw that. Amen. And that's the cloud of his glory Amen. to change the lives of people who have relived in darkness because of, of, of a religious type of thinking or spirit and not experiencing the true power of God. And because of sin and all the other things that go with it. We are children of the kingdom, kings and priests. And we carry this wherever we go. And do not think that you have messed up your life too much. That, is right. that it is not for you. That is a lie. Amen. Listen, it is a lie. Amen. We've, we, 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 I've failed in things. We fail in things. But God and through Jesus is a redeeming God. Amen. And redeems your life from destruction. You don't have to trail along a whole long trail of things that are broken and you think, I'll never amount to anything because of, of what happened, or what I did, my parents did, or so on. That is a lie. 
That is a lie from the devil. He wants to keep you passive and inactive and not doing anything. Amen. So I speak that to you, if that's where you're at today. I faced those battles. Yes. You messed up too much. Yes. That's a lie from the pit. Yes. As long as you have breath, as long as you can breathe and have breath in this life, there's redemption for you. Amen. 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 Some of you, I, I don't know, it's on my heart, I'm going to say it, might have it, it, something that you need to, to say in a place or something. Be faithful to what the Lord puts on your heart. To a person or in a place, be faithful to that. Be faithful to his word that comes on to you. You might see it comes in a small voice. It's not overwhelming always. And so it's small sometimes. We kind of, But it's the Lord speaking. When he speaks in that way, be faithful to that. Thank you again, Brother Wayne, for the message. I'm looking forward to more. All right. I'll, 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 I'll close. How will I close? I'll close with a prayer, and after that, you're dismissed. Let's bow. Father, I thank you so much, first of all, for Jesus, that the things that Brother Wayne spoke about today, that it's a reality. And without the work of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, it's that which sets us free. And then our mouth agrees with you. It's not the power of our mouth. It's your power that comes forth when we agree. It's your power, Father. It's the power of God through Jesus Christ that sets sinners free, that sets people free, that heals people. And I proclaim that in this place, Lord, in agreement with the message that was preached today and in agreement with your word. I proclaim the power of Jesus Christ to break the chains of sin and the bondage of sin and the work of the enemy. And we are against the work of the enemy and everything that he does. And we are in agreement with you, God. Oh, may we see the things that you want to do here. You're welcome here, Lord. Oh, Lord, and every chain to be broken and every, every prison door to be opened, Lord, so that people can experience the power and the freedom of Jesus Christ, the resurrection power of his life. Oh, Lord, we're going to walk from this place today and then we'll come back in a week. And, Lord, may your presence continue, your face shine upon us in every way. And, Lord, for the one, Lord, lift up the one that is and bind the brokenhearted. And heals the ones that need healing, whether in emotions or in the body, because you're the great healer. Oh, I bless you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit and for all that you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. See, when, when, we, when we, yeah, I told you you'd be dismissed. Uh, when the presence of the Lord comes, we just want to linger around. So linger around and share that it's in your heart with other people. It's so precious. Hallelujah. I guess it's, I'm not necessarily closing, but my part is over now. So you can, do you have something yet, Wayne? Well, you know, you said something what the Lord showed you on that dream or vision that you had. Uh, I think it would be very much in time to proclaim that to this generation. Make a prayer of I proclaim what God has showed me, the overflow of the water, going through the people, out the doors, and proclaim it in the valleys. This is what I see. I proclaim it as the Lord showed me. It showed me so. Can you do that? I can. Amen. I can. We receive that. Amen. And if you're part, part of the water carriers, receive that. That is what proclamation is. Amen. 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 I, 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 I will do that. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Wayne. So I'll, I'll do that now, Lord. Lord, I know what you showed me. I know. I, saw, I still see that cloud. I still see it. I, I see that. I see that rolling it down off like a waterfall off, off this platform and out over the cloud into the valley. And I proclaim, I proclaim to this generation, to the young generation, to the water carriers that are, the, to the ones that with the great strength, to the young ones that carry the water. Lord, I proclaim to them that you will carry this water and you will be the distributors of this cloud, that where you walk, this cloud will walk. I proclaim to you, you are not too small, you are not too young, you are not too weak, you are not too inexperienced. I proclaim to you that you're part of this movement, that you'll, that you'll, you'll go where this cloud goes, you'll go. 
and that you'll carry this cloud into places where you work, into places where you live. I proclaim this in Jesus' name, that you're part of this move, you're part of this cloud, the young generation and the old generation and all those you're here to hear the voice of the Lord and what he's saying to you. I proclaim this in the name of Jesus and according to your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah.